and of three for second place is a race down towards the two furlong marker and Farley Story pressed now by Matador with a prominent white face and they're then chased home on the stand side by Spinning who's coming late also coming late is Kensk under strong pressure Lipka can't win nor can Dreams End they're also racing down towards the final furlong and Matador's now raced to the front but narrowly from Farley Story Spinning's with them on the stand side is Regent's Folly who's flying home they're in 100 yards to race and Spinning's now just nose the head from Matador and Regent's Folly there then followed by Kensk and Spinning's going to win going away double for Ray Cochran Spinning wins Almahira, White Sheepskin Noseband just take to one side, hanging fire slightly. Then comes Wing Cheetah, late night out. Cubism trying to improve, but shorter from behind these. Nigrasin has fought his way to the front. Almahira still carrying his head to one side from Light the Rocket. Then behind these, Atlantic Destiny staying on. Almahira coming with a late charge at Nigrasin. Atlantic Destiny for the minor honours, but a deserved success for Almahira. And a great day for Kevin Darley. Almahira beats Nigrasin. Ian, we've heard from Andrew about David Probert. And, of course, William Buick is doing so well. But what about jockeys with you? I mean, you go back to the Leicester Piggott area, Jeff Lewis. Who were the best of the best? Well, Jeff was... He was the stable jockey when I took over as trainer. And he was a very good stable jockey. Um, he loved the horses. He used to come down from Epsom, where he lived, to ride them twice a week. And, of course, he rode Mill Reef in all his races and, and never made a mistake. I mean, he was... He was a very, he was probably the best jockey, never to be champion jockey, I, I would have said. Wonderful with his stick in either hand, that sort of thing. Um, good strong. judge of pace, very strong, beautifully built. I mean, he's wonderful mm. little. Although we were led jockey. to believe recently in the Racing Post that strength doesn't matter as a jockey. That, that's a nonsense, isn't it? Strength yeah, does matter. Of course it does, yeah. of course it does. But Jeff, um, anyway, he went from us to Noel Merlis, uh, which was absolutely the right move for him. But kept the ride on Mill Reef, of course. But after him, we we used Lester quite a lot as a, as you know um, he'd he'd ride what he wanted to of ours. Really, he'd ring up saying, "I I want to ride that if you want me," and so on. And he was outstandingly good. I think the best jockey I've ever seen, the best flat jockey I've ever seen. Just just a man who was. I don't know what the word is, ferocious isn't the right word really, but, but in the saddle he just took no nonsense. Did well, he? he was a brilliant horseman. I mean, he would win on fillies without touching them with a the whip, you know, and he'd get so close down to the saddle and to their necks and he'd just sort of push their head in front on the line. I mean, he was, he was absolutely extraordinary. He didn't have to hit them like he did the minstrel, you know, which, um, but he, he was just the most natural jockey and he was the most brilliant man to know what was happening everything in else. racing. Yeah. Knew everything. He knew all the horses, how, where they'd be in a race, what was going to make the running, um, all that. He'd done all his homework and uh, he was just sensational. And when he rang up and said, uh, I could ride this and that for you, you'd say, well, um, yeah, we'll run. You know, if he wanted to ride it, he'd have done all the homework. He knew it was going to win. Was it in those days, Ian, was it so much as much you didn't want Piggott against you as having him for you? Well, that, that was certainly, I mean, that was the saying at the time. You know, he, he was worth, I think Vincent O'Brien said it, he's worth £7 to have for you and £7 not to have against you. So you got which was, turnover. Yeah, yeah, which was true. I remember just a little story. He, he rang me up one day and he said... Uh, are you going to run that old horse up at Pontefract in a, a Monday week? And it didn't even say the horse's name. And, uh, but I knew which one he meant. It was an old horse called Arctic Judge who'd won a few races that day. I said, oh, no, Lester, he's, he's got nine stone 12. I, mean, I was stupid to, oh, no, I think, I think it was 10 12. It was 10 stone 12 because he, it was a condition race and he got a penalty for every race he'd won that year and I stupidly put him in it and he'd won four races that year so he had a two stone penalty, you know, and uh, I said, no, no, he's got much too much weight. He said, you'll win it, you know. And I said, well, how, and he went through every horse in the race. We had the racing calendar. He said, oh, that won't run because I ride that next week. That, that won't run because it's coughing. He said, that, that's no good, doesn't try, that, that one's useless. And he went down all the horses. And I said, well, if you'll ride him, I'll send him. Yeah, of course I'll ride him. And he bolted up. 
and that was the fifth race he'd won that year, Arctic mm. Judge. I mean, and I would never have dreamt of sending him unless Leicester hadn't run. Mm. But the way he went through all these horses in the race to say what they were all doing was just astonishing. And Absolutely from, amazing. And no other jockeys did that, you know. And from that sort of period, you went to who? Well, Pat Edry rode quite a bit for us. Um, Ray Cochran was very good. Ray, he was, I think, our stable jockey for a while. He rode Selkirk in most of his races. Into the final quarter, those leaders are followed by Selkirk. Hector Protector is well beaten, so are the other three. Lagrange Music, Mukadamar and Sikiston. But over on the inside, it's Shadayed from Kuyonga. Here comes Selkirk and the favourite second set trying to close. Into the last furlong, over against the rail, Shadayed from Selkirk. Now the danger between the pair is Kuyonga after her. Comes second set, but it's Selkirk swooping through to take it. Selkirk and Ray Cochran come home about a length and a half up on Kuyonga. Just coming back to Selkirk, we didn't talk about him too much amongst the horses, yeah. but obviously a champion miler and now a, an incredible sire of, of horses who like just a bit of juice in the ground. Yes, he, he was a very good horse. And funny enough, looked useless as a, as a two-year-old. I mean, it took, you know, I didn't run him till August. I kept saying to George Strawbridge, who'd owned and bred him, I said, oh, he's terribly backward. I mean, he just does, it looks goofy, you know. And the sure, moment he got on the race course, he won his first race, which was a listed race. He must have showed something at home to, for me to run him in a listed race. But uh, he went on, as you know, to be champion miler and had that wonderful race with Marling at, uh, at Goodwood in the Sussex Stakes. But he was, um, he, he, was, he was as good a miler as I'd, I'd seen, anyway. And Pat was riding it. And, and, of course, Frankie had that relationship with Locksong. And, yes. I mean, Frankie... We always see him as such a bubbly character, and of course, no one can be bubbly all the time, but is he as good fun as Oh, we Frankie's see? great fun. Yeah, he's enormous fun. He came here one day on an open day, and it was early in Claire's career, and she was on top of a, uh, um, a trailer. We had 2,000 people here because it had been well advertised on an open day that Frankie was coming to ride Lock Song, and, and she was sort of the height of her powers. And she went round the field, she went first, and, and unfortunately she only had two gears, dead slow and flat out. And I said to Frankie, look, for God's sake, don't let her go flat out because she's got a race in three days' time and we don't want her to have the race today. So Claire was on, on the, with all these people around her and we watched Locksong sort of go up, the same gallop Mill Reef had gone round. And... Anyway, she'd gone about 100 yards and, and Frankie just let her bowl. He wasn't going to hold her. And she, was, she went up to this corner as fast as anything I've ever seen go. And I thought, my God, she's going to go straight through the hedge ahead. And she turned like a polar pony round this corner, still flat out down here and eventually round here, came back to us in the middle, just managed to pull her up. And I was about to give him a bollocking, you know, for doing too much. And he said... I thought I'd just give everyone a thrill. <laughs> and that was it, you know. You, what could you say? <laughs> I couldn't say. Uh, typical Frankie. Yeah. Lovely. Toby Ian and Andrew have, obviously Andrew just a couple, but he's had good jockeys through his hands already. In fact, three, if you include Martin Dwar. Um, Ian's had some great jockeys. But, but you, perhaps, you can't say the best of the best when Ian's got Leicester, but, but Peter Scudamore, Adrian McGuire, Bob Champion, and, of course, perhaps... In most people's books, the best of all, A.P. McCoy. I mean, you've really seen the best of the best. Yes, for absolute sure. And I mean, I, you know, it would be stupid of me not to say that without doubt the best of them is A.P. Um, because he's, his achievements are unbelievable. I mean, how he's seen himself through the amount of, what is his champion now, 17 times? Um, he is just indestructible. I mean, you can't believe it. You can't believe that he will get up from half the falls he has and, and not have a day off or but not a bit of it. He's in there stomping on the thing. And, um, you know, I, I don't think for a minute he's the best tactician I've ever seen or the best horseman I've ever seen. Who would be the best tactician, just to butt in? Well, I'm going to tell you E.P. Harty. Okay, E.P. Harty. Just to please him. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, E.P. E. has been a, a, a legend in my lifetime for me. But um, no, A.P. Um, 
as I say, I, I was lucky enough to have, I had before um, AP came to me, I had Adrian Maguire. And I would actually look you in the eye and say that I think that um, Adrian, if he had been, if he had had, if he hadn't been as accident prone as he was, could have sort of achieved the same sort of quantities as, as, as AP is doing. Now whether that's a, a sign of brilliance or anything, I, I don't know, you know, how do you judge a jockey? I just have to judge them as how you, you find them to work with and then how they achieve and um, both of them were achievers. Um, Adrian was the most beautiful horseman and I'll always say that, um, you know, whereas Tony was Tony is indestructible. Adrian was very brittle. Um, he got injured much too often to really, well he never was champion jockey and he certainly was, for me, the best jockey of his particular era. Toby Boarding speaks very highly of you. What would you say about him? Um, he's a very, very genuine man, very kind, considerate man and he was, from day one, uh, when myself and Sabrina arrived to his yard, um, he was very much a father figure and looked after both of us extremely well. He couldn't do enough for us and, uh, no, a, a, a proper gentleman. And as a trainer? Fantastic trainer. Horses lasted with him. Um, never forced the issue. Real old school. Um, I think, you know, his, his record speaks for itself. He was such a fantastic trainer. As, a, as I say again, Horses lasted them year in, year out, you know. And you were given a little bit of stick for the ride you gave cool ground in the Gold Cup. Toby said that was exactly the ride the horse needed. He did, yeah. We had a little bit of, uh, we still have a little bit of banter and a bit of a laugh over that because um, I was actually conditional at the time. Just lost my claim and Toby had to uh, accompany me into the stewards room and after all the evidence was heard and pictures looked at, um, stewards asked, Mr. Balling, had he anything further to add? And uh, he shoved the glasses up on his face and said, in his opinion, if I'd have missed him once, he wouldn't have won. But he does deny that. To this day, he denies that. But I must have been hearing things. Uh, I couldn't speak highly enough of the man. Um, I was very lucky um, to have him as my early mentor when I came to England. Um, he obviously had Adrian Maguire before I came along. Um, but, yeah, he was a great man for advice. You know, I was in Toby's a couple of weeks. He came to see me at Wexford uh, races. I'd never met him. I couldn't believe that um, someone that Toby Balding was even considering giving me a job. Um, but I went, he, I met him at Wexford races and he, you know, he said there was a job and um, I came over and I was there a couple of weeks. And a good, a good friend of mine at the time called Paddy Graffin, who was an amateur jockey at the time, he now works for, for the HRI in Ireland. Um, I had actually spoke to Richard Dunwoody about getting me a job in Martin Pipes and it came about about two weeks after I'd started in Toby's and uh, I actually said to Toby, look I've been asked to, you know, the possible, there's a possibility that I could have a job um, working for Martin Pipe, what do you think? And Toby said, you know, go and see Mr Pipe, you know, he said, by all means, you know, he said, you know, go and see him and see what you think and um, so I did, I went down there one morning, met himself and, and, and Mrs Pipe and, uh, you know, got on very well with him, came back. Toby asked me what I thought and and uh, he just convinced me that I'd been better off staying with him. Um, obviously um, the Pipes had a lot of very good jockeys at the time, obviously Richard Unwoody, Jonathan Lohr um, and lots of conditionals as well, whereas Toby, Adrian had just gone to David Nicholson, didn't have a jockey and, you know, said if I was any good at all then there'd be plenty of opportunities for me. So. Um, great man for advice, um, very lucky to have had him um, I say as, a, as a friend and a mentor ever since I came. If I need any advice um, about anything, you know, he'd be one of the first people that I'd speak to. Um, and, you know, such a, such a successful, such a highly thought of family as well, you know. So, um, yeah, felt very privileged to have had, had the dealings I've had with the man. Now they come to the second last, and there Duchamp led by just under a length. Mark Equal trying to come with a run on the outside. Master Papa still in contention between the two of them, but this has been a 100% ride from Tony McCoy. Comes down towards the last fence with a narrow lead. He's over. Master Papa, a faller there. Baron lands impeded back in third place. Duchamp ridden right out. Mark Equal trying to come for one last go at him. They cross the path. 20 yards to go. Great ride, McCoy. Duchamp's home. I'm interested in, in AP, the fact that he's not the best tactician. So what, what 
actually makes it is, it, is it his temperament, his character, rather than his riding ability? I think it has to be. I mean, what drives him? I don't know what you know. His I've determination never... to yeah. win, is yeah. really. It just, I don't think anyone's had that as much as he has. Surely everyone wants to win, don't they? Apart from yes, the ones yes but they don't know, want to win as much as he does. No, that's it. You know, you, it's, it's bloody hard work being a jockey, you know, and being a good jockey particularly. You ride anything that's offered to you. you in lots of instances, you've probably never seen it in your life. Um, and AP goes out and gives all of them a ride. You know, most of the good jockeys, if they're not sure of it, look after themselves to a degree, and you can't in any way blame them. You know, if you suddenly get on some bloody thing, you know, an honest chase at Plumpton, you've never seen it in its life, you probably don't even know the trainer, um, and go and give it a ride. Um, you've always got to be considered to be a loony, you know, whereas AP does all of that and probably... Well, he's amazing. He's amazing. Um, what other jockeys have I had? Barry Fenton was a... Well, you had Peter Scoo. Jimmy. Well, I didn't. I thought you had a little bit of him. No, huh? no, no. I only, he only rode his first winner for me. Well, you, you had him then. Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> but he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't with me, though. He wasn't... I can't claim, I can't claim anything for his... Um, his expertise and, and, and um, quality of um, ability. Um, well, certainly, we, we owe you much for the jockeys you, you brought through. Uh, a little earlier on, Toby, you told us that uh, you were the man for the job horse. You could land the gamble and live off it. But Ian, you've got one or two betting stories as well we should just hear. I started I I never have a bet now I have to say I, I haven't had a bet for a long time but when I first started 1965 I used to have a pound each way on anything of ours I thought had a good chance well we had a very good year that year and I kept a little diary and I ended up 25 or 50 quid down I can't remember which it was only having a pound each way on the ones of ours I thought had a chance so I went to my big brother, who I knew bet quite a bit, and I told him just that. He said, well, you bloody fool, that's no way to do it. He said, you as a trainer should be able to say three times in a year, this will win, and have your maximum. So my second year, I ended up 300 pounds down. <laughs> so I thought, and then I read a book where this trainer had said that, you know, he had... Uh, three good things in his training life and one of them had won and I thought betting is not for me but unfortunately Andrew and Claire in particular um, thoroughly enjoy betting and I rang Claire up one night this was about five six years ago now and I said you'll be proud of me daughter I've uh, I had the chairman of the tote having lunch with me today and I managed to have an anti-post bet on William Buick to be champion jockey within the next 10 years and he has never had a ride. It was actually Trevor Beaumont and I said, Trevor, look, I, I want to back this boy. Uh, he said, what odds do you want? And I sort of thought of a number and doubled it and said, well, 500 to one, all right. He said, yes, fine, fine. And I thought then, oh, um, and Anyway, I only had a tenner. I had a tenner on 500 to 1, and I've still got my voucher. <laughs> and anyway, I rang Claire up that night, and knowing she'd be proud of me, I said, Daughter, you'd be really proud of me. I, I had a bet today. I got 500 to 1 about William Buick being champion jockey in the next 10 years. She knew who William was, but he hadn't had a ride. And she said, oh, Dad, for God's sake, you should have had 5,000 to 1. <laughs> you know, and here's me thinking I'd done well having 500 to 1. Well, that can still But anyway, still could still, I've still got the voucher. Yeah. So in wrapping up, fellas, it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Um, Ian, I just wanted to wrap up with you. I mean, you've been champion flat trainer, um, an honorary member of the Jockey Club. But your brother Toby in 2011 was presented with an OBE, which I know would probably even today still bring a, a tear to his eye. It meant a lot. And Toby's done a hell of a lot for racing as well. You know, a member of the Jockey Club, um, director of the BHA, I think, at one stage. Yeah. Um, you know, he, both of you have been very much part of the establishment, but, but Toby's work in racing 
is something very special. Uh, amazing. I mean, he's been on every committee. He's run most of them. Uh, and no trainer these days gives that sort of time that he gave during his training life even to helping the sport, which he loves dearly, obviously, and, and his fellow trainers. Um, and it was the most wonderfully deserved award, you know. Um, couldn't have gone to anyone. But I think I can speak for both of us. You know, the greatest thing of all is that we've been totally privileged in being involved in what we adore. You know, it has been both of our lives. Um, and I've always felt that it was a great privilege that I have been privileged to, to be and do what I've done and that all I've done on the sort of help fronts and one you know, are just what I would have expected of me. You know, I expected myself to do it because I wanted to do it, because I wanted to give back to racing what it's given to me. And I feel strongly about that. I mean, I really feel that we're blessed. Yeah. We have been blessed. You know, we've had good horses to train. We've had good owners. All right, we maybe deserved them. You know, you work for it, but um, but lots of people have worked at the same level and as hard, and have, you know, haven't got the recognition or whatever. You know, we've we've had recognition, we've had success, um, and I'm very proud of racing. I'm very proud to be in racing, <clears throat> to be part of it, um, and to have made a living at it. Yeah. <laughs>